next Tuesday or the following if, when you're free next, Ori. Thank you. Um, and you'd like to discuss, amazing. Who would like to discuss this case um, with uh, Ori? Ideally, someone identifying as a woman. Please don't make me late for my meeting. I'll get in trouble. You know I can't finish by 10, but I'm going to try to finish before 11 today. Pacific time, sorry. Who would like to discuss with Ori? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Who would like to discuss this case with Ori and myself? If you're thinking, but it's a neurology case, if it was renal, okay, I didn't even have to say my whole thing. Rebecca Berger, wonderful, thank you for volunteering. That is great. Um, okay, who is presenting the case today, um, Travis? Um, Catherine is presenting the case, a case that we saw in the ER. Fantastic, so Catherine, uh, Ori, Rebecca, if you'd like to introduce yourselves and we will get rolling. Hi guys, my name is Catherine. Like Dr. Smith said, um, I just finished, I'm a fourth year medical student. And I just finished my last rotation with Dr. Smith in the ER. And so this was an interesting case that we saw. And Catherine, didn't you match? What did you match in? Yes, I matched into neurology at University of South Florida. Wow, fantastic. Congratulations, welcome to the absolute Thank best you. specialty of all time with all due respect to the other specialties. <laughs> I'm sure are fine as well. Travis, are there some other case discussants joining us this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah we have two, two rookies. Two rookies, all right, okay. Chief concern is diplopia, Go, no, okay. Um, all right, thank you, Catherine, and wonderful to have you, future neurologist. Um, and then Ori and Rebecca, you wanna introduce yourselves quickly and we'll, we'll get rolling. Sure, um, so I'm a, eighth year MD PhD at Columbia in New York. Um, and I matched at UCSF for neurology starting this summer. Fantastic, two future neurologists, amazing. And congratulations to you. Eighth year uh, MD PhD, I feel you, it took me 10 to, to, do, to do both. And um, you're about to have an amazing experience um, training at UCSF, what a wonderful place. So that is phenomenal and appreciate you discussing and we'll love to hear your, um, your case uh, next week or in the future. And Rebecca, it's okay if you're not a neurologist or future neurologist. We we are neither. All <laughs> neither. Um, I'm Rebecca Berger. I am an attending hospitalist in internal medicine at Cornell in New York City. Um, I do suffer from uh, relapsing and remitting neurophobia, so I'm uh, I'm here um, to challenge myself, but uh, anxious. I will say so. Uh, thanks for thanks for everyone's flexibility. I can I can teach you a lot about diuresis, but uh, when it comes to neuroanatomy, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be on my on my toes. This is why um, we need specialists of all kinds because diuresis. I just got a little bit tachycardic my, myself there. So um, fantastic. Well, thank you for volunteering, and that's um, part of the fun here for us all to go a little bit outside of our comfort zones with an unknown case and see what we can come up with together. Okay, so Catherine, do you want to give us just the chief concern, just the chief complaint, as few words as possible, and then Ori, Rebecca, and myself um, will discuss, and then we'll go from there. Just the chief concern. Okay, so a 76-year-old male presents with double vision and dizziness. Double vision and dizziness. Wow, I already guessed diplopia. I'm, on, I'm off to a good start this morning. Okay, Rebecca, um, do you want to take either or both of those chief concerns and just let us know how you would um, think through this as, a, as an internist? Or as, um, yeah. I'm happy to take dizziness first because that's definitely a complaint that I feel more comfortable with given my expertise. So um, just like the neurologists, we as internists, I mean, obviously encounter patients with dizziness all the time. Um, I think having listened to you, Dr. Berkowitz, give us a, uh, you know, a rundown of neurology, I would definitely want to know about the time course of the symptoms, um, because I think a, a kind of hyperacute or acute dizziness would be very different to me than something that's been going on for years. Um, but I think in this case, dizziness is something that I can't localize anywhere. Um, I think uh, dizziness could definitely be a manifestation of systemic illness like orthostatic hypotension. Um, I think important to differentiate between lightheadedness and vertigo, um, because vertigo is definitely going to kind of put me more in a neurologic category versus lightheadedness, which again, I think 
takes me back to questions of orthostatic hypotension, arrhythmia, things like that. Um, so yeah, I think I would start with lightheadedness versus vertigo. If vertigo, then you know certain uh, exam features might help me distinguish between peripheral and central. Um, if not vertigo, if it's lightheadedness, then I'm thinking about orthostasis, arrhythmia, anemia, um, really tachycardia. I mean, so many kind of systemic illnesses can manifest as lightheadedness. I'm muted, sorry. Thank you, Rebecca, that's um, fantastic. I think you called me Dr. Berkowitz, please call me Aaron, or I can call you Dr. Berger, um, however you're, <laughs> your, your preference. Don't you dare. Um, okay, deal. So fantastic, right? The first question with dizziness, right, is, is this a patient that um, is going to get admitted to Rebecca's service or to my service, right? Is this a medical cause of dizziness or a neurologic cause of dizziness? We're going to presume since Catherine is going into neurology and is presenting on a Tuesday that we're moving down the neuro pathway, but we still, it's important to, to think through this. And, and Rebecca made a number of excellent points. So a um, couple of uh, things to point out. Um, one is the classic teaching, right? I think it comes from Drockman and Hart, a paper in the 70s or 80s, is that there are four types of dizziness, of which um, Rebecca mentioned two. Type one um, dizziness being sort of lightheadedness, which then, as Rebecca said, we'd be thinking, is this orthostasis? Is this heart failure, arrhythmia? Um, is this patient is on too many blood pressure medicines, antiarrhythmics, um, uh, et cetera? Type one lightheadedness um, makes us think something more uh, cardiovascular. Type two, Rebecca mentioned vertigo, the true sensation that the room is spinning, right? And that people would say, well, if it's really true vertigo, it must be a neurologic or neurootologic um, etiology. Type three dizziness in this paper is, is imbalance. In other words, the patient says they're kind of unsteady on their feet, but their term they're using is dizziness. One of my great teachers who gives a wonderful talk on dizziness, I don't know if it's on the internet somewhere, Marty Samuels used to say he, or still says, <laughs> he likes to ask patients, are you dizzy in your head or dizzy in your feet, right? Because is it a sensation in your head or are you unsteady um, on your feet? And when you're unsteady on your feet, that could be anything from neuropathy to um, cerebellar disease to just orthopedic issues with the nip or knee or hip, sorry, nip or hip, the knee or hip, making one um, unsteady on their feet. And then type four is sort of nonspecific grab bag of anything from panic attacks to anxiety to medication induced, just sort of vague sense of dizziness, but it's not really lightheaded, it's not really vertigo, and it's not really unsteadiness. Now, um, a few decades later comes along Dr. David Newman Toker at Hopkins, who's um, uh, a neurologist, neurootologist, neuroophthalmologist, and health services researcher, who really has devoted his career to trying to um, reduce diagnostic errors in the field of dizziness, surveys a bunch of patients in the emergency room, multiple choice versus open-ended versus um, interview and finds that patients are not consistent in saying whether the room is spinning or not. And even if they are, that it doesn't correlate with it being a neurologic etiology and says his PhD dissertation is actually called why asking the type of something like why asking the patient what type of dizziness they have is something we shouldn't do anymore or something. Or why is the worst question to ask? Okay. These are still important, right? If the patient reports, I get dizzy when I stand up, we're going to think about orthostasis. And if they say the room is spinning, we're going to call it vertigo, but that these are not as reliable as they seem um, and that we should focus on the timing and triggers of dizziness. And so the timing meaning, as Rebecca said, is this a sudden onset dizziness or is this sort of a chronic outpatient um, condition? Now, Catherine said this patient's in the emergency room, so we're already a bit um, biased there, although some patients come to the emergency room with chronic problems. So is it acute or is it chronic? And if it's, um, and what are the triggers? Is it um, not triggered at all, it's just spontaneous, or is it triggered? And if it's triggered, what's it triggered by? Is it triggered by rolling over in bed, changes in head position, makes us think of BPPV? Is it triggered by standing up quickly, it makes us think of orthostasis? Uh, is it triggered by exertion, it makes us think of a cardiac etiology? So um, someone can put in the chat, um, I have a tutorial that has the figure from my book that has acute versus chronic, chronic then episodic, versus um, continuous. And then if it's episodic, is it provoked or unprovoked? And if it's provoked, what's the trigger? So depending on what we hear in the history, we'll walk down that um, pathway. But if it's acute, sudden onset dizziness, also called the acute vestibular syndrome, sudden onset vertigo or dizziness. Again, we have to be a little careful because it's hard for patients to describe. There's really two or maybe three things on the differential, Rebecca. When you, when you hear of sudden onset acute dizziness, you tell us you were worried. And what would you be worried about? Uh, definitely posterior circulation stroke or TIA. 
Yep. So posterior circulation stroke is the not to miss diagnosis that David Newman Toker has devoted his career to trying to make sure we don't miss. And what's on the, there's um, other less common, I should say, they're actually more common in this setting, but less common conditions we might think of than something so common as stroke. Do you, what else would you consider here? Say you think it's a stroke, you get an MRI, it's negative. What else is sort of there on the differential for this sudden onset continuous vertigo? BPPV. Yeah, so BPPV um, is one. Episodic, when, really. It's really episodic. And actually, BPPV, the episodes are really short. Um, there are seconds to minutes. And although patients will um, say that they felt kind of off for hours, it's, it's like if you go on a merry-go-round or amusement park ride, right? You're really dizzy on the ride. You're really dizzy when you get off. And you just don't feel right for some hours. But the actual, if you pin, pin down the history in the patient, the actual BPPV episodes are really short. And by the time they get to the ED, it's probably over. They might just feel a little woozy. But um, you're right in thinking of something peripheral. So the main differential diagnosis, what David Newman Toker wants us to really learn how to distinguish between is a posterior circulation stroke and vestibular neuritis, which is an acute, and it looks just like stroke clinically patient is dizzy, nauseous, vomiting, nystagmus, unsteady on their feet, comes on not as instantly as stroke, but pretty fast. And it's some type of viral or post-viral inflammation of the eighth nerve. Those are really the two things. And we'll talk if it, <laughs> these become relevant as what signs would help us distinguish those on, on exam. And the other thing that I would conclude on that differential as is always on all neurologic differentials is just toxic metabolic. One of my co-residents had an amazing case of a, a stewardess who on the flight down started feeling um, uh, dizzy. And by the time she got to the emergency room, she um, had a depressed level of consciousness. She was ataxic. Everyone thought she was having a stroke. By the time she got her MRI, she had recovered. Turned out she had reached into her purse to take her vitamins on the landing, but accidentally took, instead of a handful of vitamins and supplements, a couple of Ambien's. And Ambien's supposed to make you asleep. If you're awake on Ambien, you look like you're having a cerebellar uh, stroke, apparently, according to my friend in this case. So toxic metabolic, alcohol intoxication, drugs, et cetera, could make someone really dizzy too. Um, great. So I think we've we've rung out dizziness pretty well. Excellent, Rebecca, thank you. Um, Ori, want to take a stab at double vision or what comes to mind with these two things together? Sure. Um, so thank you for taking dizziness, Rebecca. That, that, I hate the dizziness. Chief. Um, so Ori, you're gonna, I started residency the same way. David Newman Toker was my advisor in medical school. And I thought, why is this guy so obsessed with dizziness? There's so many interesting neurologic conditions. Then I became a neurology resident and realized um, you, 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 you better um, reckon with your hate for dizziness because you're gonna see a lot of it. And it actually becomes pretty interesting when you, um, when you, when you um, learn his approach, which maybe we'll talk more about. So I, I, I feel you on that. I started there too. And I wondered why is this guy so obsessed with dizziness? There's so many interesting things to be obsessed with in neurology, but um, you'll see in the emergency room and in the clinic, a lot of dizziness. So, um, so uh, you'll have to reduce your, your, your hate, your hate for, for dizziness as I did. Um, so yeah, no, I will. Um, so <laughs> for double vision, um, of course, if we think about um, localization. So for me, that usually means like malalignment of the eyes. So it can be like a neuropathy of um, like the ocular, like three, four or six. Um, and then in this case, now we have potentially multiple cranial nerve deficits. Um, if we have an eighth nerve deficit leading to dizziness um, and then um, one of uh, a cranial neuropathy in three, four or six. Um, and then of course we want to know um, the, the time course of this. So is it like, uh, is it acute or um, subacute or chronic? Um, and that can get, a, get us a little bit deeper into the etiology or kind of prioritizing the differential for what's causing this. Um, and that's where I have, that's where I am for now. Fantastic. Great discussion, Ori. So for double vision, that's exactly right. Double vision in most cases means the eyes are not um, fully aligned, right? Um, which is binocular double vision, meaning if the patient covers either eye and some patients will try this, they're seeing clearly, but it's just that the eyes are misaligned. And so the brain is seeing the images not, um, as they're, as they should be, and is having trouble, um, fusing them. So, um, there is such a thing as monocular diplopia. That's usually some type of lens problem or some issue with the eye itself, where it looks like, um, you know, just like you were looking through sort of a, a scratched glasses or, or, or foggy glasses where it could look a little obscured, but, um, diplopia as we normally think of it, or as is more common as binocular, um, diplopia. So you're right. How do the eyes get misaligned? We have to think of that whole pathway, right? So the brain controls the eyes. It controls them by 
um, activating uh, centers in the brainstem. If those become relevant, we'll talk about them, but it's kind of complicated. And then from there, we have the brainstem nuclei of cranial nerves three, four, and six, the ocular motor nerves to distinguish from oculo motor nerve, which is three, right? So three, four, and six are gonna then head out to the eyeballs and innervate the extraocular muscles through a synapse at the neuromuscular junction. So anywhere along that pathway, we can get diplopia, right? If you have a lesion in the brainstem affecting one or more cranial nerve nuclei, or their interconnection, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which helps yoke the eyes when they're moving horizontally. If that becomes relevant, we can talk about it. Um, and then you could have a problem with the cranial nerves en route from the brainstem um, to the eyes. For example, in the skull base, in the cavernous sinus, a meningeal process, all of those could affect the nerves en route to the eye. You could have a problem at the neuromuscular junction and nearly all patients with myasthenia gravis will present with one or more ocular motor findings, whether that's ptosis or diplopia, and people often say myasthenia gravis is sort of um, uh, the, one of the great imitators of eye movement problems because you can see things that are different between different examiners because of the fatigability. You can see something that looks like a six nerve palsy, but it's sort of fatigable muscle weakness in myasthenia. Ptosis would be a clue, but not always there. And you can have problems in the muscles themselves. Most common thing um, would be thyroid eye disease, right? Where you actually have inflammation of the extraocular muscles, usually um, not all of them, right? So you get something asymmetric in that case, it's not a weak muscle, but it's a tight muscle presenting, preventing the eye from moving in the um, opposite direction from that muscle's action. And then you can get orbital processes, right, which could just restrict the mechanical movement of the globe, um, something like a tumor in the orbit, a vascular malformation in the orbit, um, orbital cellulitis, those sorts of things. Right, so, um, right, as you said, Ori, we have both dizziness and double vision, so those um, unless the patient is dizzy or has a subjective sensation of dizziness because they're seeing double. If these are two sort of um, full-fledged uh, chief concerns, right, that a combination of double, net, double vision and dizziness makes us think of something that's going to either involve multiple cranial nerves or their um, origin in the brain uh, stem um, or their sort of control in the cerebellum. When you both hear that double vision and dizziness um, together, does that, um, and we're in the emergency room, what does that sort of make you think when you hear those two things together? Again, barring just the patient is seeing double and so they just sort of feel a little um, off because that's not, un that's not comfortable to see that way. What would, what would the, if it's true diplopia plus true dizziness vertigo, what does that um, make you think of? Any thoughts? Yeah, brain or stroke in either the brain stem or the cerebellum. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, when we hear acute vertigo by itself, if neurology is being called, our main question to determine is, is this uh, a posterior circulation infarct or hemorrhage? Um, that's going to be the, the most dangerous not to miss diagnosis, right? And we talked about um, all the different ways we'll be able to try to tease apart on exam as this peripheral or central vertigo. But if you walk into the room and the patient's eyes are closed and they say, I'm so dizzy, I'm, I'm so nauseous, I can't open my eyes, and they open their eyes and they're pointing in two different directions, right? We don't really need to get into the nuanced nitty gritty of the HINTS exam, which we'll probably end up talking about because we say, well, this patient looks like they're having a stroke. Their eyes are sort of um, pointing off in two different um, directions. Sometimes the findings are more subtle and that's more challenging. But right, if I heard, you know, sudden onset diplopia and vertigo, I'm worried about a stroke in the posterior circulation um, brainstem or cerebellum. If it's sudden, if this is a process that has emerged, you know, over a slower time course, then we'll have to obviously um, think through those, those buckets. Great. So um, as you all know, I like to spend a lot of time. You're thinking, he said he wanted to end by 10 um, uh, on the chief concern because we've, we've really laid out our landscape here, right? What type of dizziness is this? Is this monocular or binocular diplopia? Is this sudden onset um, or slower in onset? Um, and is um, And yeah, those would be the main things. So as we hear the history, we're already sort of moving along our various um, places and various uh, localizations, as well as through this um, framework for dizziness, is this acute or chronic? If it's chronic, is it episodic or continuous? If it's episodic, is it provoked or unprovoked? And if it's provoked, what's the provoking factor? So the history is just going to sort of guide us through all of these things, and um, we'll see where we are uh, after that. So great, Catherine, thank you for those four words engendering uh, such a fantastic discussion. And Rebecca um, and Ori, um, wonderful um, uh, first pass. I would say first pass through third pass of the, this, this chief concern, and we'll um, we'll see what comes next. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay, so his should I uh, talk about HPI and review of systems? Yeah, you can um, give us the HPI, and then um, as unless um, I'll leave it up to your um, 
your discretion, if you want to give us the past medical meds, um, all that is sort of one package, or you think you want to withhold that and have us just uh, discuss the history. But um, if you'd like, you can take us all the way up to, but not including the physical exam um, uh, as you like. Okay, sounds good. All right, so a 76 year old male presented to the ED with dizziness and double vision. The onset was four weeks ago and he describes the course as fluctuating in intensity. He reports the dizziness as feeling off balance. It became pronounced when he was driving and felt like the cars were stacked on top of each other, causing him to almost crash. He also reports that he has also noticed that his left eyelid has been intermittently drooping over the same time, time frame. He reports nothing seems to make it better or worse. He currently reports his vision is at baseline with his corrective lenses. So the review of systems, no focal weakness, numbness, vision loss, shortness of breath, dysphagia, headache, chest pain, palpitations, trouble swallowing, or slurred speech. Um, his past medical history, he has mild cognitive impairment, restless leg syndrome, benign essential tremor, GERD, vitamin B12 deficiency, obstructive sleep apnea, familial combined hyperlipidemia, benign prostatic hyperplasia, and chronic low back pain. Um, so his meds are vitamin B12, 100 micrograms, Zyrtec, 10 milligrams, Omeprazole, 40 milligrams, and Pramipexol, 0.5 milligrams. And his vitals, BP 159 over 86, pulse 91, respirations 18, oxygen saturation was 99% and his temperature was 37 degrees Celsius. Great, just to make sure we um, have the history. So four weeks ago, sudden and onset fluctuating double vision um, and dizziness. And then any other details for us about the dizziness from our discussion, is it vertigo or is it um, worse when he's in any particular positions or anything um, like that, or um, dizziness that he just sort of feels is because he's not seeing properly? Yeah, so it, during um, my exam with him, when I would try to get him to explain his double vision and dizziness further, he, he would mostly just describe his dizziness as just feeling off balance. He didn't really know how to describe it. Um, and so that's as far as I could get with the dizziness. And then the double vision, he said it was stacked on top of each other. Stacked on top of each other. Great. And you mentioned he noticed this most while driving. And I feel like as neurologists, we always, patients always develop their visual field cut or notice their double vision while driving. And then they say, so I decided to drive to the hospital. We say, pull over. <laughs> Why don't you pull over? Um, okay. So this is a, this is a uh, common uh, scenario. People first notice this when, when, when driving, um, I guess a, a situation in which we're using our eyes and focusing um, on what they're doing um, with great intensity, maybe bringing these things out. Great, um, Rebecca, you took the first um, pass last time. Ori, what are you um, thinking uh, now at this point with all this um, new information? Um, okay, so for me, the, um, the time course is a little bit reassuring, especially that it's fluctuating, um, suggests that maybe it's not something that's super acute that we need to then act quite quickly. Um, it is, you know, one thing that's hard to know is, is it truly returning to baseline or does he notice it less? And does that lead to the fluctuation in his like awareness of the issue? Um, there are a couple of things in the HPI that I would like to know that would kind of rule in or rule out things. So for example, like, is it worse at the end of the day or um, something that's worse in the beginning of the day? Um, in terms of the vertical stacking, um, that now, I, that is a, like a, is a classic finding of one of the um, ocular motor nerves, but I don't remember which one. Um, and, um, but again, also reassuring that, that there's no other kind of this like neurologic review of systems is somewhat negative. And um, perhaps I'll leave the, the dizziness and kind of putting that together with two, Rebecca. Yeah, um, Ori asked a couple of great questions and I always like to ask people, as I always like to ask um, clinicians, I see asking questions. Can you tell um, everyone why you're interested in the timing over the course of the day? That's a great question. What, um, what was on your mind when you wanted to know the answer to that question? So for example, if uh, it gets worse over the course of the day, you might think of um, like fatigability with myasthenia. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was, especially in the context of ptosis. Yeah, fantastic. So, so great pickup, right? This is fluctuating. 
Um, and um, I want to hold in my mind something. I wanted to also ask you about something you said about that. But right, if this is fatigable weakness, right, um, that is sort of buzzwords for um, myasthenia gravis, right, a neuromuscular junction problem um, where the symptoms fluctuate. And as you said, the ptosis going along with this, although you could find a package of ptosis and diplopia, right, which could be um, a cranial neuropathy. Um, oh, give away which one so we can discuss that, right? But um, could be um, a package you could see with myasthenia as well, depending on how the eye movements are abnormal in relation to that ptosis. Um, you said at the beginning, if it was fluctuating, you would be less worried. Um, what made you say that? No, I think just that it, it, it had started a lot like longer time ago. I would, that's, that's why I would be less worried. Um, Got it. Yeah, not necessarily fluctuating. Okay. Um, are there, and, and again, worry is obviously relative as you were saying, right? If we would be worried if the patient has my, myasthenia gravis, but less so than if they're having, you know, um, basilar thrombosis uh, in the acute moment, right? Um, um, are there any things here that could still be in that sort of emergency room um, worrisome, uh, I should say, capital W worrisome acute uh, life-threatening emergency category that could fluctuate like this with these symptoms? So fluctuate, like when uh, neurologic symptoms fluctuate, I think of, uh, I think of um, seizure that's, and, and you could have then have weakness at like post, like a TODS after um, seizure and other things to worry about in this context, I guess, not, not that would be fluctuating that I can think of, but. Yeah, great. So fluctuating, we could think of seizure, seizure presenting with Oh, with uh, diplopia probably wouldn't um, quite fit, although seizure can do anything. Um, seizure presenting with dizziness, I believe there are case reports of sort of ictal discharges from the somewhere in the temporal lobe presenting as vertigo, but also not common. Yeah, there's probably one other thing. I know it's a little guess what I'm thinking, um, sort of fluctuating um, neurologic symptoms of this nature, but I'll, I'll hold it um, for now and see uh, Rebecca's thoughts on this, this aliquot. Um, <laughs> Any, any additional thoughts that came to mind? So Ori has raised the possibility of myasthenia with fluctuating uh, entosis, and he's mentioned that vertical diplopia um, stacked like that sounds meaningful, but um, uh, not 100% sure of the exact meaning. And then I've raised this possibility of are there any worrisome, uh, again, worrisome is relative, right? But any sort of acute neurologic emergencies that could be fluctuating so much that the patient could have these symptoms, but look normal in front of us. A little bit, guess what I'm thinking. So feel free to not answer any of those questions and just let me know what you're um, thinking as you're uh, hearing this new information. Um, I can't place what you're thinking, but I'm very curious to hear what it is. Um, I think going back to the HPI, I think as with many of our dizzy patients, the dizziness is kind of hard to pin down. It doesn't sound classically like a lightheadedness or a vertigo. Um, the fact that it was worse when driving um, kind of suggests against something like an orthostasis, which typically is positional. Um, and again, the fact that it's not kind of classically sounding like vertigo maybe leads us away from some of those diagnoses we were thinking about. Um, but it's also not an unsteadiness on his feet, right? If we were talking about his B12 deficiency and wondering whether his supplementation was insufficient, whether that's because he has a malabsorption problem or because of his PPI, um, you would expect still that the that the, if it was really neuropathy causing this off balance feeling that that driving wouldn't be the the precipitating factor. Um, the left eyelid drooping, I also kind of that was a little bit of a buzzword for me thinking about ptosis. I don't know whether myasthenia can be unilateral. I've always thought about it being mostly bilateral. Um, so it does make me think maybe of like a cranial nerve three palsy, which I think could give you both the somatic innervation going back to neuroanatomy of the of the eyelid as well as obviously controlling some of your extraocular movements. So. Um, and I know that cranial nerve palsies can definitely come from a lot of different causes, ischemic, compressive, et cetera. Um, he has this history of familial hyperlip hyperlipidemia, so he has risks of, of ischemic um, causes of, of cranial neuropathies as well. So those are kind of my thoughts, and I want to know what, what the waxing and waning uh, <laughs> potentially worrisome diagnosis is. Yeah, sorry to hold you in suspense on that one. Um, so, so great thoughts, Rebecca. I agree with you that dizziness... Um, although we had fun sort of talking about all the different types of dizziness and how to think through them. This sort of sounds to me more like, quote, type three, type four, even though David Newman-Toker would be disappointed uh, in us for still using those terms. But um, 
it, it, this sounds maybe just, you know, when he has double vision and he's driving, you sort of feel woozy, right? When it's sort of like, is that the, are those the yellow lines or the, 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 um, the diplopia, you know, aspect, the yellow lines. So I agree. I'm not sure this is going to sort of be a localizable neurologic dizziness and may just be the subjective sensation of living with fluctuating double vision in your brain constantly sort of trying to adjust to that rather than going down this, you know, saccule, utricle, eighth nerve, brainstem, cerebellum pathway. So I um, agree with you there. And then you're exactly right. What if we said diplopia and ptosis and just took that as a unit and took sort of the time course and fluctuation out of it? Um, well, I think you're right on. You would say, well, is this a third nerve palsy? Because the third nerve innervates a number of extraocular muscles as well as the, the, the levator palpebrae. So a third nerve palsy could cause ptosis and often it's severe ptosis, the eye is fully closed. And when you lift it up, the eye is down and out um, because only six and four are uh, working and they're um, activating the lateral rectus um, for out. And then it's a little complicated how it ends up out because the superior oblique has sort of a very um, uh, particular action that um, if it becomes relevant, we'll get into, but it's a little bit um, harder to explain, right? And then you raise the interesting point, what if, always interesting to think about what if these chief concerns are unrelated and his diplopia is this new problem he's presenting for, and he's just unsteady on his feet because he has neuropathy due to B12 uh, deficiency or because he's tired um, from sleep apnea or because in this age, most gait disorders are multifactorial. And he might have a little neuropathy from B12 deficiency, a little spinal stenosis from degenerative disease, some mild cognitive impairment, some decreased vision, and now double vision, multifactorial sort of gait um, disorder uh, of, of older individuals. So um, let's talk a little bit about ptosis, right? Because we're going to want to really look at what that is on the exam. You asked me, um, should the ptosis be bilateral and myasthenia? Gee, you would think there are neuromuscular junctions on every muscle, the body shouldn't myasthenia be symmetric. And often at presentation, usually it, it isn't actually. Patients will have unilateral ptosis um, or asymmetric ptosis um, or you know, unilateral eye movement um, abnormalities or asymmetric. Um, so that, that's um, fair game uh, there. So um, as far as ptosis, there's a couple ways you can get ptosis. So Rebecca, you mentioned a third nerve palsy um, uh, or you mentioned uh, myasthenia. Any other conditions that can give us ptosis, either named conditions or categories? So Horner's can. Yeah. So um, Ori, tell me how you would distinguish a Horner's from a third nerve palsy as a cause of ptosis, if you're if you if you're able to. Uh, so you would look at pupil size, I think. Yes. Yeah. Keep going. So, um, so Horner's is ptosis, meiosis, and um, anhydrosis. So you would be looking for a, for a small pupil as opposed to a large pupil if it was a cranial nerve three uh, problem, correct? That's absolutely right, fantastic. Yeah, what a great, one of the rare instances of medicine, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, it sounds like Dr. Seuss wrote the, um, wrote the triad for that condition, right? So I used to always confuse meiosis and mydriasis and tell you meiosis is a smaller word, so that's the smaller pupil, mydriasis is the big word, it's the dilated pupil. So, right. So if you saw ptosis and a big pupil on the same side, that third nerve is busy, right? It's doing the levator, it's doing four extraocular muscles, and it's doing pupillary constriction. Um, and so if that's out, you could see ptosis and lift up the eye and then a big pupil. Um, the pupillary fibers of the third nerve are on the outside. So sometimes you can get pupillary findings without extraocular motor findings from a compressive cause. And you can get a nerve infarct in diabetes, like uh, Rebecca mentioned, where you just get the internal fibers and actually you spare the pupil, but it looks like a third otherwise. So big pupil, ptosis, usually complete ptosis, um, third nerve palsy. And in Horner's, the meiosis, right? You have a ptosis and a small pupil on that side. The other thing is the ptosis in Horner's is usually more subtle. Usually in a third nerve palsy, that lid is down like a curtain. And when people say, well, what does a third nerve palsy look like? And people say down and out and the pupil's blown. I always joke, no, it looks like this. <laughs> the eyes closed, right? You have to lift it up to see all that stuff. And in Horner's, it's very subtle. Usually the lid comes just to the limbus, the top of the iris. And the other thing is you get um, what's called inverse ptosis or lower lid ptosis, where the lower lid is actually slightly elevated also. And that's because the eyes wide with fear, right? The sympathetic response, you're opening your lids using Mueller or um, tarsal muscles, they're called. And that sort of makes the eyes open wide when that muscle is weak. In Horner's, you get a little bit of upper lid ptosis and a little bit of lower lid ptosis and a small pupil. Great. And then the other things that are just mechanical oculoplastic causes like levator dehiscence that sometimes fake us out for myasthenia and older individuals. And it's just a mechanical thing where the skin, redundant skin has sort of um, loosened or I don't know the mechanism, but. Okay, great. And so what was that thing I was thinking? Well, what if we talked about posterior circulation stroke here, right? 
what if this patient has critical stenosis of the basilar artery but has not yet um, fully um, occluded it? These patients can have repeated stereotype TIAs of the posterior circulation. Often we think of TIAs, you say, well, if it's cardioembolism, right, well, one day they had a TIA of left hemiparesis, and then the next day they had a right hemiparesis, and they had um, amaurosis fugax, because things are just going up at random, and why would they keep going to the same artery? But if you have a critical distal stenosis, um, like the basilar, um, patients can present with sort of fluctuating double vision vertigo and have these spells that may be when they're a little bit um, hypotensive or when they're a little bit dehydrated. Um, and this is just the warning sign. This is like the, the end STEMI, right, of the brain that the basilar is critically thrombosed and it's, and it's flicking off little things or it's sort of getting to 100% and the patient's having repeated um, TIAs. And so that's a not to miss diagnosis with a CTA or MRA in this case, depending on more of the story and what we see on the exam, if we look at this patient, they have myasthenia, we don't need to worry about this, but if this is really fluctuating and we really can't tease anything apart on the exam, gee, we could worry that there's a, a critical basilar um, stenosis um, there that um, could need intervention before um, this completes itself as a basilar stroke. So that's sort of what I was thinking there in the fluctuating category, seizure uh, as a first pass, I agree with you, Ori, and then with these particular posterior circulation symptoms, or if they localize to a particular artery, right, we could worry about a critical distal stenosis that's um, fluctuating. We want to look for that. Um, great. So now we have a lot of hypotheses going to the exam too, right? What does that ptosis look like? Is there a pupillary problem? These stacked vertical images, um, to return to uh, Ori's question, that would just mean the eyes are vertically misaligned, right? So um, is there a fourth nerve palsy on one side so that the eye superior oblique is not working, so it can't um, intort and uh, um, depress the eye. It's a little confusing, right, that the superior muscle is bringing the eye down. Um, or is this an inferior rectus problem for a partial third or a complete third if the ptosis uh, is also related, right? Or is this a skew deviation, which you can see from a central lesion or from an inner ear um, lesion that the eyes are sort of vertically misaligned due to what we would call a supranuclear problem, meaning not a problem of the nerve or the nucleus, but of the um, structures that sort of are one up in the hierarchy controlling them. So we're really interested in seeing this cranial nerve uh, exam. And then um, based on that, if there are clues for myasthenia, which is on our differential, we could talk about other maneuvers to try to um, bring those out. Um, and if the patient looks totally normal on exam, and we're still thinking about myasthenia, we can talk about other maneuvers we might do to, um, to bring those out as well. Okay, we're very excited to hear your exam, Catherine, tell us. Okay, great discussion so far. Um, on general exam, he was alert and no acute distress. The skin was warm, dry, pink without rashes. Um, head was normal cephalic and atraumatic. Neck was supple without tenderness. Eyes, uh, pupils were equal, round, reactive to light. Extraocular movements were intact. Vision was 20-20 bilaterally. There is unilateral ptosis of the left eyelid, normal visual fields. He notes his vision is worse with both eyes open and corrects his vision by closing one eye. On cardio exam, there was a regular rate and rhythm, no murmur or edema. Um, respiratory, lungs were clear to auscultation, non-labored breathing, breath sounds were equal. GI, soft That's and okay, you can just tell if, if it's normal outside of the neurologic exam. You can just Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. Yeah, um, definitely as you're an intern, you'll want to present all those systems, but for us, we can we can zero in on, on the fun stuff. Sorry, internist. Sorry, Rebecca. Sorry, Ravi. <laughs> so, so on neuro exam, just ptosis of the left eyelid and everything else was fine. Is that right? Yes. Um, so Quickly, I'll just read what we what we wrote for neuro alert and oriented times four, no focal motor or sensory deficits. He had a bilateral upper extremity resting and intention tremor. Um, all cranial nerves were intact. Motor strength was normal, sensation normal, and speech was normal. Reflexes were also normal. And extraocular movements were normal as well. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and did he experience any diplopia on the exam, even though you couldn't see anything, or? Um, yes. So uh, on exam, he, well, when I would ask him to look at me and if I would ask him, okay, can you see me side by side or up and down? He said no. Um, but when I would ask him, are you having double vision? Like, do you see some things double? He would say yes. 
Um, he was he. It was difficult to get a history from him. Um, he he couldn't really describe his double vision or dizziness well at all. I did want to say I did ask him a little bit about fatigability, and so I asked him, "Is it better in the morning?" And he's like, "No, I think it might be better at night." Um, so he would have like these fluctu even during the exam, it was fluctuating uh, double vision. Whenever I asked him to like, are you having double vision right now? He, he would say no. But then when I would come back, he would say like he had some after I left. Got it. This is like, yeah, patients tell you, I've seen this problem and it's, I, we always feel like, and I always, you know, say to patients, like when you bring your car in, right? You say it's making this noise and they say, oh, you know, I don't hear anything, right? They say, I promise you it's making, you know, that the noise when I'm, when I'm driving. Um, promise <laughs> you it's, it's double vision when, you, when you're not, when you're not here, right? And um, that just speaks to the fluctuating nature of this symptom, right? So, um, okay, um, I think you're up first, um, Rebecca, and any thoughts on this exam and how it takes us closer to or, or further from any of the possibilities we've been um, considering so far? Yeah, it sounds like um, his, the extraocular movements being intact definitely argues against a third nerve palsy because um, you really wouldn't expect him to have just isolated ptosis. Uh, similarly, uh, the fact that his pupils are equally round and reactive, he doesn't have that unilateral meiosis or medriasis, tells you that it's probably not a Horner's or a third nerve palsy. And so I think we're back to kind of the question of, of myasthenia maybe. Um, it sounds like his diplopia is binocular um, and because uh, it improved when he covered one eye, you said. Um, and I we didn't hear this specifically, but I assume no nystagmus, not that we were thinking about some of those vertigo causes, but um, that's usually just something I would do as part of my extraocular movement exam as well. Um, and then doesn't sound like we have anything to suggest any other kind of more systemic neurologic process like a peripheral neuropathy or anything else with the exam. So I think it sounds like it's the isolated ptosis for which um, we don't have any other kind of cranial or coral that's maybe taking us back to something at the neuromuscular junction. Yeah, fantastic discussion. Cornell neurologists can um, turn off their pagers today. Rebecca will not need to consult you on her hospital service. <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, ex exactly right. Um, so you use the exam here to say, are there other signs of a third nerve palsy? No. Are there other signs of um, Horner syndrome? No. So we're just left with an abnormal lid. Um, and in this context, uh, a fluctuation and double vision that um, the patient is experiencing, right? Because those eyes have to be perfectly aligned and even just a slight misalignment that even our own eyes examining the patient can't see, um, sometimes you can bring out through other um, maneuvers, which we'll talk about, but um, all, all sort of fit, start to, to, to move us toward um, myasthenia. We have fluctuation, we have ptosis, we have double vision, but not one that we can sort of um, localize to a particular cranial nerve. Fantastic. Um, either Ori or Rebecca, um, any um, exam maneuvers you're aware of that could help us sort of um, confirm or move us even closer to our hypothesis of myasthenia gravis by um, things we can do at the bedside? Yeah, so you can uh, you can see how long they can look up for. Um, and then I believe there's like also you can like have them like hold air in their mouth and see how like how long that's one other thing is like how long that they can keep that there. Yep, those are two great ones. Any other bedside myasthenia um, tricks of the trade, Rebecca? And then I can throw some on the table as well. I usually call you guys when I think there's myasthenia. So uh, okay, that is a, that is a fair move, and we will call you if we think um, the creatinine has uh, has risen. So um, we have a deal. Fantastic. Um, right. So uh, Ori mentioned what I joke to patients is the most boring test for them in medicine. I say, remember in high school history class where you used to count all the dots on the ceiling um, because you're so bored. That's what I need you to do now. Just look up at my finger and just keep looking up. And what you're trying to do is um, look for fatigability, right? And that totic lid um, might start to slowly come down like a curtain showing you that it's truly fatigable. Um, another thing you can do, there's so many um, interesting maneuvers here to test this fatigability is you have them in that uh, position looking up and then you move your finger quickly down and then back up and while I should say, move it down for a little bit and then have them come back to um, sort of midline position. And just that resting of the eyelid when it's down, sometimes when they look up, they have what's called Kogan's lid twitch where that rest allows the eyelid to go back to where it was and then it quickly fatigues back down. It's called Kogan's 
um, lid twitch, a kind of cool thing to see at the bedside. So you let them rest for a moment and then come back up and see it's better. And then it slowly comes back down to tadic. Another really cool maneuver based on the physiology is everything about the eyes is about symmetry, right? So you want those lids to be the same. You want those eyes to be in the same position. And so the patient um, may be trying <laughs> to get that tadic lid up. But since it's not working, a lot of that information is flowing to the other lid. So if you actually relieve the ptosis on the tadic side by lifting the lid up, you'll actually see the other lid go down. That's called Herring's Law. So that you're trying to send energy to both sides to get them symmetric. And it's sort of going to the other side when you say, hey, you can relax. Let me fix that lid for you. Then the other one um, comes down. Another really cool test you can do is if the ptosis is significant enough, go get a pack of ice and then um, put it in a towel so you don't um, you know, give the patient frostbite and put it on the eyelid for, I forget how long you're supposed to do it for, but you can Google it. And then when you take it off, the ptosis um, improves. It's called the ice pack test. It's very um, sensitive and specific for, I don't know the numbers, but for uh, neuromuscular junction issues, somehow it's the cold is speeding up neuromuscular um, transmission or something. I don't know the, the first year of medical school explanation for how that works, but the ice pack test is a cool one. Um, or I mentioned the respiratory test, usually we would do that in a patient who, who has more than ptosis, right? Who has, you know, um, body um, uh, weakness as well. And we're admitting them when we want to just get a sense. Rough bedside measure of vital capacity of the patient take as full a deep breath as possible. And then count sort of not too fast, as high as they can. And roughly every 10 is about a liter of vital capacity. So if you try this now or after a morning report, take a huge deep breath and count one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, you should be able to get to, you know, 40 to 50. And if someone, you know, with Guillain-Barre who, who's looking like they're getting sicker, myasthenia, you know, um, neurologic causes or any of uh, uh, vital capacity, that's something we do. And you can track that on, on morning rounds. I find patients have difficulty with this. And one, two, three, four, five, six, and you have to really seriously know you have to take the full deep breath, hold it, and then, and then, and then count or um, that's cheating. Um, other things you can do for fatigability, you take both arms in the in the wing position and um, actually just, uh, yeah. And then you test deltoid strength, five out of five, symmetrical. And then you have them take one side and I say cluck like a chicken and count to 50 and fatigue that, bring the arms up again, do your test. And then you'll see that side that you have fatigued is a little bit weaker. So lots of um, tricks of the trade we can do on exam to sort of look for this uh, fatigability um, and other subtle signs. The diplopia, if we're not seeing anything, we can do things like the cover uncover test and see if the eyes, often the eyes will move a little bit, but are they moving up, down, up, down, up, down, that we're sort of by breaking fixation, unmasking whatever the underlying issue is, or we could put a red lens and do the Maddox rod stuff, but that is um, super confusing uh, to explain and we're, we're getting uh, low on time and I will confuse myself um, explaining it. But those are ways of looking at um, using a red lens and a light. So the patient's seeing a light and a red line through the lens, how those are aligned can sometimes help you figure out um, uh, what the cause of the diplopia is. Okay, so sounds like the three of us are all thinking about myasthenia here. And um, what would be the next test you would send aside from uh, putting a pack of ice on the eye? Rebecca or Ori, how would we, we're in the emergency room um, and uh, either, yes, we've been consulted or <laughs> we're the frontline providers like um, Travis and Catherine and thinking, um, think this is myasthenia. Um, what should I do now? You could send serologies for like anti zucal interceptor and then like musk antibodies and stuff like that, but that probably wouldn't come back for a couple of days. Correct. Yeah. You would want to send the anti uh, acetylcholine receptor antibody test. Um, musk is another uh, uh, antibody. There are others being discovered. Musk, I'm pretty sure it tends to be more common. I may be wrong about this. Um, in younger women, it tends to be a little more um, fulminant. There's sort of a bimodal peak of myasthenia. We all think of you know, autoimmune diseases in younger people and maybe a, a propensity towards women, but um, generally uh, there's these two peaks, younger women and then older men uh, for myasthenia. So this patient falls into that latter category. So yeah, we could send serologies, but we'll be uh, waiting for a while. Um, other tests you would be interested in at this stage? Um, I think if my suspicion is high enough, you could think about getting thymic imaging, um, CT chest. And then the patient didn't describe any shortness of breath or dyspnea, but you might want to get some baseline respiratory mechanics um, so that you can monitor them over time if you think it doesn't sound like he's having symptoms of a myasthenic crisis per se, but um, good to know if new symptoms developed kind of where he started. Absolutely. Right. So if we're sort of doing the myasthenia workup, we have to look for a thymoma or thymic hyperplasia. And recent trials have come out 
um, and including the extension trial in the past few years, I think it's the MTX trial or something like this. Anyway, that has shown that um, even without thymoma, removing the thymus appears to have um, benefit in these patients. So we definitely want to look for thymoma. Does this patient have myasthenia as a primary condition or is it a perineoplastic um, syndrome? We definitely would want to um, know that. And yeah, getting baseline respiratory um, parameters, um, a good idea as well. And then was there a third thing you said, Rebecca, or are those the, those the two? Those were the two, but now that you brought it up, I think myasthenia can be perineoplastic. So um, I, I would have to look up what, what malignancies is associated with and decide what else to, to look at. Yeah, into. I think thym you know, looking for thymoma and then chest CT would be the first pass and you know, when in doubt, guess small cell lung, which is sort of <laughs> very common um, for perineoplastic. But if we didn't find anything and um, yeah, you might wanna consider um, looking elsewhere for malignancy as well. Um, I saw in the flying by in the chat, people asking about doing the Tensilon um, test. We really don't do this too much anymore with the serologies, even though it's still on step one. Um, patients can become really bradycardic. It's kind of hard to find um, Tensilon. Um, so, and it almost seems sort of like um, a parlor trick kind of thing that you're going to make all the symptoms go away with the somewhat risky <laughs> thing. So unless the patient's in the emergency room or on the ward and you have the cardiac monitor on, but I don't think I've I don't think I've ever actually done it. I, I haven't done it. I'm not sure I've even seen it, you know, done when I was a resident or things like that. So, I mean, unless I guess the patient is in extremis and really going downhill and you're wondering, do I want to give this patient procholinergic stuff before I know what's going on? Maybe in that case, you would um, think about it. But I think it's sort of just a bedside diagnostic test that has, um, at least in my experience, not, not done too commonly. So yeah, I think we would send the, we do the ice pack tests, send the antibodies. The patient just has ptosis and double vision. Um, probably tell them to stop driving for a little while and, um, and set them up with an ophthalmologist, neuro-ophthalmologist or neurologist. So um, Catherine, what did you and uh, Travis um, cook up for this patient in the ED? Yeah, so do you want me to give you all the tests, including the answer, or do you want me to stop before the answer? Um, I think everyone is, um, uh, has wagered on a final diagnosis. Why don't you, um, if, if new information you're about to give us may change our perspective on that and lead to a diagno different diagnosis, then pause maybe before so we can reflect. But if, um, if the tests we asked for are the ones that um, you got and <laughs> they're going in the direction we expect, you can, you can finish it off. Okay. Kat, do the, do the labs imaging and then our test at the end. Okay. Do it all you said, Dr. Smith. Why don't yes. you go ahead and present um, what you have step by step, and I'll give you a stop sign if I want us to okay. stop and, and discuss. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, so CBC, he was slightly anemic and glucose was at high at 121. BMP was normal, lipids were normal, hemoglobin A1C was normal, TSH was normal, his vitamin B12 was normal. We did a CTA, had a neck, and that was also normal. Um, and then we also did a brain MRI, which also was showed no evidence of acute intracranial processes. Um, so we decided to por perform an ice pack test in the ED and his unilateral ptosis improved five millimeters after three minutes. And then we, um, we admitted him to the hospital and then they tested for the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And so his uh, binding antibody was high at one, or sorry, 24.7. Uh, blocking antibody was high at 72, and modulating antibody was high at 77. He also had an EMG, and the results are still awaiting. Fantastic. So, yeah, the cheapest diagnostic test in the world, the ice pack test, right? <laughs> um, fantastic. Great. Well, strong work doing the ice pack test in the emergency room before you've been called um, neurology. I love that. And yeah, um, fantastic. So yeah, I'm not sure I can interpret the difference between binding and blocking and all that stuff, but he has um, myasthenia. Um, but sometimes those antibodies are negative, what we used to call seronegative myasthenia. Now there's musk. There are some other ones that have recently come out that I um, have not committed to memory yet. And if all of that's negative and gee, you're really sh sure it still looks like myasthenia, you can do EMG nerve conduction study. And um, Ori or Rebecca, do you know um, what you're looking for on the EMG nerve conduction study? Um, so I think repetitive stimulation, yeah. Yes. 
So, right, just like you fatigue the muscle from working it, right? And it fatigues, you do repetitive stimulation um, and look at the, um, the compound motor action potential or CMAP, and you see this decrement um, with stimulation. And actually with Lambert-Eaton syndrome, which I've actually never seen, but is apparently floating around out there somewhere, um, it's a pre presynaptic neuromuscular junction disorder. You do that repetitive stimulation, you actually see an increment. Um, so th that's distinguishing. And then there's a relatively newer test um, called single, single fiber EMG, which looks for a phenomenon called jitter, um, which I don't really fully understand um, the neurophysiology of that, but it's also a very sensitive test for neuromuscular junction disease in general, though it doesn't distinguish between pre and post synaptic. Post synaptic being myasthenia, pre synaptic being Lambert Eaton or botulism, two very rare um, diagnoses. So Great. Um, what uh, would you do for this patient, Rebecca, if he was admitted to your service or, or if he was admitted to you, your service in, in, a, in a year or two? He has just a little bit of ptosis. His testing has come back negative. We'd want to look for a thymoma for sure or thymic hyperplasia. Um, uh, does he need any treatment or? He's symptomatic, so I presume we should at least discuss treatment, um, a bit outside my scope to figure out risks and benefits and whether it's worth treating for isolated ptosis. I mean, it's enough to cause him to potentially be unsafe driving. So if, if we believe that putting him on protostigmine might help, then probably, probably worth doing. Again, he doesn't have any respiratory issues, it sounds like, but, um, but symptomatic for sure. Yeah, I agree with you. It's the diplopia seems disabling and right. It's a risk for him for driving. So we'd probably, if he's in the hospital, see how he does with pyridostigmine. It's pro-cholinergic, right? So you can get um, drooling and all of that um, kind of stuff with that. So it can be a challenging medication in someone in um, crisis and we're worried about their airway. But yeah, I would probably try that um, and slowly titrate it up, see if we can get rid of that double vision. And if we can't, then we might want to um, use some more disease modifying type of therapy. So sometimes these patients with ocular myosin, you can get away with just a real low dose of um, prednisone and kind of just slowly titrate it to where you need it and then titrate it back down. There's all sorts of protocols for um, how, to do, how to do that. If it was really just the ptosis and you were convinced and he doesn't have a thymoma and he says, okay, well, now I know what it is. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. You wouldn't necessarily have to do anything, but I think the diplopia would probably try to treat with pyridostigmine and if ineffective, think about um, some steroids. Um, and a lot of patients have just ocular myasthenia gravis. And I think, I don't know the exact numbers, I think 50% uh, or so will ultimately develop sort of systemic or kind of, um, I don't know if there's a appropriate term, but just general, generalized myasthenia gravis. And some will just hang out with uh, ocular myasthenia, um, which uh, has its own particular type of disability, but less so than not being able to walk, not being able to use your arms. Um, Great, wonderful case presentation, Catherine. Thank you so much for bringing um, this case and brilliant discussion, um, Rebecca and Ori, um, getting to uh, you know the possibility of this diagnosis within one um, aliquot and finding the um, hypothesis confirming um, things as we went along. So great. So um, I think Kirtan is uh, debuting his uh, teaching points today. So um, we'll hear those and then we will um, we'll move ahead. Hey, can I share one thing before Kirtan goes? Go for um, it. The, the one, one of the cool things about the case is, you know, you know, the whole neurophobia, and I think we all have it, but we took the two complaints, dizziness and, and double vision, and we went to the CP solvers uh, app on the computer and, and, and pulled up the schema and we followed it. And it took us right down and we're like, hey, let's do this simple ice pack test. And Kat went and did it. And I did not even think it was going to work. And she's like, it worked. And um, it was it was one of the most like gratifying things to do. You know, I don't ever really do that in the ER. I mean, it's not my thing, but just having the information there and just seeing, you know, you know, hearing about it and, and following a schema made it, you know, a really cool, um, you know, gratifying case and seeing it all tie together when the follow up was, was awesome. So and hearing Fantastic. the discussion was even amazing. So. Thank life you. imitating art, imitating life, right? He <laughs> saw these symptoms and said, ptosis, that's not an everyday emergency room complaint. Let's see if CP solvers has a schema for it and what's there and what we can sort of um, think through as the first pass. So that is um, phenomenal. Um, well, thank you so much for, um, for uh, taking such good care of this patient in the emergency room and uh, doing an ice pack test in the emergency room. That is strong work of a future um, neurologist. And um, again, great uh, presentation, Catherine, great discussion, Rebecca. Uh, and Ori, hope everyone's neurophobia is um, diminishing. 
Kirtan, as much as I would love to hear your teaching points, I unfortunately have to run to a um, work meeting. So I'm going to depart and know they will be um, excellent. And thank you all for this wonderful morning report and look forward to um, your case next Tuesday or your, uh, whenever you're able to do it. And hope you saw how much fun Rebecca, Ori, uh, Catherine, and myself had. I will be excited to uh, participate next week. Right. Sorry to leave early, but I will um, see you soon. What's that? Do you mind making me a and do you mind making me a host before you bounce? Because if you leave now, the meeting will end. So just make me a host, the, the host, and then um, we can hear Kirtan Sahib. Oh yeah, don't worry. Um, Anne Marie awesome. was here so earlier, and um, and uh, and uh, I'm a co-host, but I've made you a host just in case. But great to see you, Robbie. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. So Travis, can I go? You're. Go Take ahead, Kirtan. Take it away, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. So what an amazing discussion. Thanks to Aaron, Orai, and Rebecca for amazing discussion. And thanks to Catherine for amazing case. So we started with dizziness, diplopia. And Aaron very astutely pointed us that there are numerous papers how to zoom in on dizziness, whether dizziness is actually a vertigo, whether it is a lightheadedness, or whether it is just vague imbalance kind of thing. And often history is not something that we count upon when zooming on these symptoms because the patient's uh, account of the symptoms is not reliable. So time course and the triggers are the key. So for example, if you are turning on in the bed and then you get the symptoms and benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is something that you can consider about. And if it happens upon standing up, so like sudden changes in the posture and orthostatic hypotension and something more towards the cardiac pathology or autonomic nervous system is what we consider about. But whenever we think about the symptoms, we have to prioritize, right? So acute must not miss causes like posterior vertebral circulation being affected by a stroke kind of pathology. So that is something we must not miss. And another acute pathology that is vestibular neuritis, usually caused on by some viral infections. So that is to be borne in mind. And as usual, toxic etiology. So medications, over-the-counter medications also needs to be at back of our mind, right? So dizziness is the first complaint. Then we have the diplopia. And diplopia is very juicy one. So all of you discuss very excellently that how we can differentiate between the monocular diplopia or the binocular diplopia, whether there is a problem in the brain stem, whether there is a problem along the course of the root itself. So whether the meninges are involved, whether the cavernous sinus is involved, or whether the problem is lying in the orbit itself. What if there is a thyroid pathology there, right? Pseudo tumor kind of thing. What if there is a problem with the neuromuscular junction? And now we are getting closer. We are getting closer to our final diagnosis. So how the clues came in, it was very interesting to see. And regarding diplopia, I also wanted to mention that some of the grave causes like raised ICP and mass lesions are also something that we have to consider about. And as the past medical history and examination came, we kind of dwell deep into the problem, right? So we got the hint of possible fluctuation in the diplopia, whether it was worse in the day, whether it was worse in the evening. And this case also proves that why the classic things never happens in the medicine, right? I mean, it, it improved as the day passed by rather than worsening as we classically expect. But still, there were lots of other findings that pointed to that possibility. So we had unilateral tosses and we ruled out any extraocular muscle pathology. So the extraocular movements were normal. So that again pointed to us towards the neuromuscular junction pathology rather than the cranial nerve palsy. So that was very interesting. And finally, to seal the diagnosis, we did the cold back test, right? So we applied the cold ice thing and then the diplopia started to improve. The tosis resolved. So it further raised the suspicion of neuromuscular junction disorder. And just regarding the cold test, I very briefly wanted to mention that there is something known as like myotonia congenita and paramyotonia congenita, which are also kind of channelopathies like sodium channelopathies, and the sodium uh, chloride generopathies. So we can even differentiate amidst them using cold pack tests. Some of them improve, some of them versions. So that is one very nice test to differentiate as the Aaron mentioned in the emergency situation. And finally, to complete the puzzle, we need to order the serological tests, right? So we need to look for antibodies like anti-acetylcholine esterase antibody. We need to look for muscle specific kinase antibody. And there are some rare ones like alginine antibodies or low density lipoprotein related protein antibodies. So we can look for that. And always we should consider the fact that patient can suddenly deteriorate. So the respiratory function is something we have to check in mind. We might need to intubate the patients. So treatment takes the priority in that sense. And of course, we have to look for any tumors, right? Thymoma is one thing we don't want to miss. 
So once we have looked for thymoma, then we can be a little bit assured that we can go ahead and treat it. And usually we treat it with anti acetylcholine esterase inhibitors like iridostigmine, neostigmine. And if that's not enough, we might even go for immunosuppression in the form of prednisone or mycophenolate or acetylcholine. And I'm so excited to hear that the case was presented excellently. And you guys, the Travis and the Catherine managed the patient very well. So thank you for that. And look forward to you. Look forward to seeing you next time. All of you. Thank you. Awesome job, Kirtan. Thank you for that. That was that was fire as usual.